Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. But uh, my name is Dustin, I'm the lead pastor here. And it's an honor that you're here today to celebrate all the things that God has done. And we have an incredible service today. And we're gonna have a multiple, a few of us are gonna be sharing. And in the house today, uh, we have 24 of the 30 years of pastors in the room today, which I think is absolutely remarkable that, like, that, that, that we're all able to be here, the, the three of us today. And so uh, what we're gonna do today is gonna be a little bit, just kind of we wanna celebrate, we wanna uh, learn about what, what God has done, but also become expectant of what we believe God is going to do. Because we think that 30 years, I think there's 30 more years ahead. 30 more years of what God can do. So what I want you to do is I want you to stand to your feet and welcome Pastor Ron Donater up to the stage. Let's give it up for Pastor Ron. We're going to honor him today for your years of service to our church. Thank you so much. I love you. It's cool when you get to uh, see your son-in-law and daughter take over a church that you put your own heart into for a little while. Um, <clears throat> And um, Dustin kind of expected me to go in a certain direction today, and uh, I was gonna. <laughs> and then as I started preparing, it was kind of like the Lord said to me, yeah, no, not this time. <clears throat> so God kind of dropped something into my heart here today, and I want to just, <clears throat> just pick it up fairly quickly because I only have like 10 minutes. And so... I'd never preached 10 minutes before in my life. I just want you to know that. But anyway, we'll, we'll figure this out. Joshua chapter 3. And uh, we'll, we'll just move quickly through this. Um, there's, this is the story of... Um, yeah, I'm in Judges chapter 3, and I'm thinking, why on earth can't I find my verses? That's why. Joshua chapter 3. This is the story of, of Joshua beginning to lead... The, uh, the Israelites into the promised land. And um, there's about seven or eight little things that I just want to bring out. So first of all, it says Joshua rose early in the morning, set out from, from the uh, place they were naming Acacia Grove. They came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, they lodged there, so on. Now, God says to him, here's what you got to do. You got to send the priests with the ark to cross the Jordan River. And he promises them that as soon as the feet of the priests touch the water, the water will stop flowing. Now, here's, a, here's an interesting thing. Uh, chapter 3, verse 4. Yet there should be a space between you and the ark, about 2,000 cubits. That's about a kilometer. Don't come near it so that you may know the way which you must go, for you've not passed this way before. <clears throat> and there's a couple of things there. First of all, when God starts to move, you've got to be ready to move with him. And I just really feel like that's a word for this church today. When God starts to move, you've got to be ready to move with him. Uh, there's, there's no end of times where God starts to move and we miss the, we miss the memo. And uh, God starts to move and we're not keeping up. <clears throat> Second is if you're a leader, you've got to figure out how to get your followers to move with you. Because it's one thing for the leader to move and another thing for the followers to move with them. And, you know, in the whole idea and the whole concept of churches, I don't know how many times I've seen, just in, in, in my own experience, the, the pastor starts feeling like God's leading in a direction, and pretty soon the church is sort of looking for a new pastor because they don't like where he's going. Um, so when, when God starts to move, you got to get ready to move. But if you're a leader, you have to get your followers to move. And then the third thing there is God's going to show you the way, but you can't run ahead. You, you cannot run ahead. You got to leave a kilometer between you and God. God's going to go ahead. He's going to get things ready, but he's going to show you the way, but you can't get ahead of him. <clears throat> when you start getting ahead of God, things get into kind of trouble. <clears throat> Excuse me. So then uh, the next thing I want to just kind of look at is uh, the, um, the verse, about verse 15, it says this. 
as the, the priests who bore the ark came to the Jordan and the feet of the priests who bore the ark touched the edge of the water. And then it, in parenthesis, it says, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest. Uh, and that the waters that came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zaratan. And, I, you know, I, I often think to myself, I wonder what the people there thought, right? They're sitting there and all of a sudden the river stops flowing and the water's just piling up. And it's like, you, you, gotta, you, you gotta know they were getting everybody around to, to watch it. Like, what on earth is going on, Right? And when God starts to move, he starts to do some, some amazing things. And it says, God will do wonders among you. You know, and the question is, what, what, what can God do among us? What, what is there that God can do? Now, you know, leaders have to step out in faith first. And one thing I've experienced, I imagine, Jonathan, you've experienced that. Anybody who's been in ministry knows that the pastor tends to go through the hard time first, and then the congregation starts to experience it. Often God leads us as pastors through a tough time and we think, man, this is just really, really hard and nobody seems to notice and it's, you know, no, does anybody care? And, and th then you finally get through it and then the church starts going through it and you start watching people have to go through it. And the joy of that is that once you've been through and once you sort of have, have it in your heart that God can, can give you the breakthrough, then you've got the faith to believe for the breakthrough for the people who are following you. Now, you know, um, next thing I just want to point out, God doesn't pick the easy looking time or way. Like he had 40 years plus, plus, plus two, right? There was two years they wandered in the wilderness. Then they went 40 years in the wilderness. God could have picked anywhere in that time. Why does he have to pick the time when the Jordan is overflowing? Like, couldn't he have picked the time when the Jordan was just a kind of a trickle? And then said, okay, now we'll just dry up the waters and you can walk across and then we'll let the waters... No, God's got to pick the hardest time. I got thinking about different examples in scripture and there's several, but the one that jumps out at me is the, the one where Elijah goes and finds the widow. And, you know, it, it, <clears throat> Bible doesn't say this widow had a big bag of flour and a big jug of oil and she said to Elijah, oh, sure, I can make you a cake, no problem. We've got lots left. no. God sends him to this widow when she's got one meal left. And Elijah says, well, if you make that meal for me, the rest of it will never run out. You know, God never picks the easy time. It seems like he just doesn't do that. It seems like he picks the hardest time. <clears throat> and I know that there are times where I've asked God, you know, why does it always have to be the difficult way? Why does it have to be so tough? Right? Right? And, and I love how our, our pastor will often put this. He'll say, well, God will often say to me, I took you the easiest way you'd come. I took you the easiest way you'd come. If, if, if you'd have been willing, I could have taken you an easier way. But so often it's, it's our own issues that get in the way. I remember some of the best advice um, that, I've, that I've had, probably quoted it more often than anything, is God's never late, but he's not usually early either. He, he has his timing and he has his way and he's going to follow it. Now, <clears throat> back to the story. Verse 4, um, or chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, when all the people had completely crossed the Jordan, God says to, to Joshua, go and get 12 memorial stones. Go and get 12 good strong guys to pick up the biggest rock they can have to carry it on their shoulder and pile them on the, on the shore as a memorial, as a testimony. You know, when everyone is through, that's when it's time to celebrate and to build a memorial. And something that it, that it, uh, it explicitly says is that, you know, you've, you've got to tell these stories to your children and to your grandchildren. You've got to, you've got to declare them to others. Um, rehearse the memories. Build the stories. Now, you know, I, I know that <clears throat> I could probably easily stand here for 10 minutes and tell stories about what happened while we were pastors. But <clears throat> I don't even have a tie on and I'm all phlegmy. Why is that? I don't know. But I think what the Lord is saying to you today is start building your own stories. Start building your own stories. You know, it's a very interesting thing that those memorial stones marked a turning point. They marked a time, a place and time. 
And it's like God was saying to Joshua, okay, the history is the history. The past is the past. What happens is what happened, for good or for tough. Now start a new, a new chapter. Pile the stones up and move forward and, and move from there. Start to, to, to build up some new momentum from the things that are happening now. Then <clears throat> Joshua 23, if we just flip over a little, little further, um, there's a, there's a very interesting little, little spot here in verse 6, chapter 23, verse 6. All of a sudden, you remember how in the last chapter of Deuteronomy and then in the first chapter of Joshua, there's four times where the Lord says to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Four times God says, you think Joshua might have had a little bit of an insecurity complex? I, I, I kind of feel that way. Because otherwise, why would God have to say it four times? But here's what's really cool. You know, here we are at the other end of Joshua's leadership journey. And what does he say to the rest of the children of Israel in verse 6 of chapter 23? He says, therefore, be very courageous to keep and do all that's written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn from it to the right hand or to the left. And it's very interesting that as, as he's come through all of those challenges and all of those difficulties, he's graduated to the place where now it's him saying it to others. I've proved that God is strong. I've proved that I can trust in him. I've proved out his goodness to me. Now it's my turn to say to the next generation, be strong and courageous and follow what God has. You know, don't always look at the future and hope for God's blessing. Always acknowledge what he's already done and build on that. But acknowledge what he's already done in your life, in your experience. I just really feel like that's a, that's a word for, for you today, Dustin and Beth. Um, and then... The, the last little, little thought here is in it, just a couple of pages over in Judges chapter 3. There's a very odd little verse here. And I'll just read verse 1 and 2. It says, Now these are the nations that the Lord left, that he might test Israel by them. That is, all who had not known any of the wars in Canaan. And then it's in parenthes, parenthesis, it says, And this was only so that the generation of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formerly known it. And as, as I kind of meditated on that, I kind of thought, you know, isn't it interesting that the Lord would leave some of the enemies in place so that the ones who had it easy would learn how to struggle through and push through? You know, 2 Timothy 2 verse 3 talks about enduring hardship as a good soldier. And th there's something about pastoring and about leading a church that just requires some, some incredible tenacity and incredible backbone. Because it, it is not an easy job. Let me tell you, you don't, you don't become a pastor of a church because you want to make a ton of money. Right? I mean, in all seriousness, that's not why you do it. You don't make, become the pastor of a church because you want to be really popular and loved by everybody. It doesn't work that way. <clears throat> You know, you don't become the pastor of a church because you think to yourself, well, that's an easy job, man. I just have to work Sunday morning and get the rest of the week off. It's hard. There's hardship we have to push through, and it's tough almost every day. And there's a level of pushing through difficulty that most people will never actually grasp or understand if they haven't been in that place. And so let me, let me just kind of wrap it up with this. You know, is it easy to build up a good, strong church? Well, you didn't sign up for easy. It, it's not easy. But we didn't sign up for easy. We signed up for following God's will and following God's call. Um, is it easy to believe God for enough? For enough finances? For enough helpers and leaders? It's, is it easy to believe God for enough time? But again, we didn't sign up for easy. We, we signed up to do what God has called us to do. You know, we love to focus on the results. We, we all, our, our whole society has been taught to focus on the results. Are you successful or not? Well, what'd you do? Where's the results? But in God's kingdom, we have to focus on the process. Really, it's all about the process. We love to focus on the results in the sense of accomplishment, but God focuses on the process and the growth that comes with working through the process. That's where God's heart is. That's what God focuses on. 
And I just feel like for today, just as a church, I need to challenge you to say that don't focus on the, the circumstances around you. Don't focus on counting numbers and looking at the bank account. Focus on what is God doing today? What is God doing in me? What is God doing in us? What is God doing in you? And go with that. And focus on that. And success comes when God takes us through the process and we're growing in him. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, Pastor Ron, amazing, amazing word. Um, and so I want to ask you again, we're going to invite uh, Pastor John. So I want to encourage you to stand up again and let's honor Pastor Jonathan and give him a hand as he comes and shares an amazing word. This guy has been an amazing encouragement to me. We've met multiple times and I love you. Thank you for everything. It was a joy to turn church to Dustin and Beth those years ago. I've been watching this glass of water. I was thinking maybe... I don't know who it was set here for. So I'm, I was thinking, well, let's see who takes the first sip of the glass. <laughs> there, was a, uh, there was a man, a farmer who lived on the edge of the city, and he had a little farm with some farm animals. And um, beside him was this beautiful farm, you know, the white board fences, and the, the farm there raised thoroughbreds. And... Um, Every week, they would load up their trail of, trailer of thoroughbreds, bring them into the city to Northlands, you know, where the old track used to be. And they'd race these horses, and then the farmer, you know, would watch this beautiful trailer full of thoroughbreds come back with ribbons and all these things that they'd won at the races. So finally, this farmer with his little collection of animals decided he'd had enough. He loaded up his donkey into the back of his pickup truck, you know, the pickup truck with the big boards on the side. He followed the trailer full of thoroughbreds into Northlands. Filled out all the paperwork, did everything, got the donkey ready for the race, lined him up in the gates, and everyone around them said, you don't, you don't honestly think that this donkey has a chance in this. And he didn't say much, he didn't say much. The next guys came, you've got to be kidding. You put this donkey in the race, look at all these Look at all these horses, they're beautiful, they're strong, they can run. So finally, after taking a little bit of ridicule, the, the man said, I didn't bring my donkey to win the race, but I hope the association will do him good. I'll give you a minute. That's how I've felt many, many times as I've, I've come to victory and Pastor Ron and Pastor Veronica, our association with you right from the first days we came through the door almost 20 years ago as a couple of, well, I was a donkey. My wife is much more <laughs> purebred than I was. <laughs> and uh, during all that time, uh, our association with the two of you and with the church and our association with uh, the other pastors that were here, I had this unique experience of actually working with and knowing all of the pastors who pastored here. Uh, Roy Byer was here, and when we first came, Roy was around, and we had opportunity to, uh, to work alongside him and meet him. And, and then while we were pastoring here, Pastor Helmut and Edie Isert came and were here, and I had opportunity to meet them. And also just to hear some of their stories about the church, sense some of their heart about what had gone on here and what their passions were while they were here. And so uh, through all of that, we just felt like our, our mix with these, these families and people of God, and then all of you, many, as I look out, many of you were, were here and have been here, and our association with you was always uh, a blessing and encouragement. And so uh, thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to come and celebrate this is, a, uh, this is an unusual place. I don't know if you remember the first time you tried to come to Nolan Victory Church. For us, we actually looked it up in the phone book way, way back. We were going to a church on the other end of the city. We were living on the West End. Uh, do you know what a yellow page is? 
So we pulled out a, like a phone book. It was paper. And there was like writing in it and stuff. And we actually had to go down the list. And I don't know how we ended up at Victory Church because it's not the first one that pops up on the list. But it was the closest uh, address to us, kind of, at the time. And so we looked it up, looked up the address, and, and came, came to the church, walked through the doors. But we, we didn't know where it was, because when you drive by, you're looking for a church, right? And this doesn't look like a church. Uh, so the, the location itself is unusual, and the look of it. And, and if you just start going down the list, I want to just share three, three kind of characteristics and thoughts. One, this is an unusual place full of unusual people, okay? But it's, it starts with the location. It starts with the place. It even starts with the way that you ended up here. You ended up here because you were going somewhere else. It wasn't ready. The work wasn't quite done, so it was like, let's just land here for a while. That's an unusual way to land somewhere. Well, we'll just, it was like you're driving down the road, you're not quite ready to go into the place, so you just pull over and park for a bit? Well, that's kind of what happened. Now, it's been a good parking spot for 30 years, right? It's unusual the way that it has involved itself in different aspects, and the way that you as a people have been involved. I think of um, years gone by when we we would go to men's and ladies' conferences or, or boot camps or things like that. I remember one year in particular, we went from here as a, as a men's group to the men's conference. And there was a, the, the number of men who went, I can't remember the exact number, but I remember thinking, this is 85% of the men in our church that went to the conference. And as we got there, we were a fairly large group, maybe 30 or so, and... Uh, I wasn't super well known in the victory circles, but when we showed up with 30 men, everyone else thought we must be a church of, you know, 200 or 250 or whatever. And so they started talking to me like we were this mega church. I said, no, this is pretty much all of them. <laughs> this is pretty much all of the men. There were a few that couldn't come. But that's unusual. It's an, and the same happened with the ladies' conference. And I actually remember uh, hearing one time, the men might shudder at this, but there was one time that the ladies went to the ladies' conference, and a lot of them, and they took an offering at the ladies' conference. Some of you men might remember this. So they took an offering at the ladies' conference, and I got a phone call a week later and said, hey, I just, I just want to let you know. It's from one of the VCI executives. I just want to let you know we calculated the offering, and we think that these people from your church, um, like we think this total is from your church. And the ladies from Victory Church had far outgiven all the other ladies at the ladies' conference. And it was incredible. And they said, well, I'm just calling to let you know. that I don't know what happened, but it, we just thought you should know. That what happened is the ladies that came from your church just gave so much. It was some project or mission, mission event or something. That's unusual. Because we're not the biggest Victory Church. So that level of generosity and that level of kind of buy-in. When I think of another unusual thing, worship was awesome this morning. And it has always been awesome. When we came in 20-something years ago, there were ladies dancing with flags at the front. There was dancing all around. There was a stage that was about this high. Okay? <laughs> but there was this expression of worship that was unusual and, and life-giving and full of energy and God-honoring. And it was awesome. And for many of the years that, that we pastored here, there were, there were Sundays where our worship team was all men, which is absolutely unusual. And it wasn't because we didn't want women on the worship team. <laughs> It was just an expression that kind of happened. And there'd be a, a team of all men here leading worship passionately, heartfelt, full of energy, devoted. And you could just sense it. The men were leading. The, whole, the, the families were engaged. And it was strong. And it was unusual. 
I'm also aware of lots of unusual. There's been lots of unusual ideas through, through all of the years. And there's been ideas about, I, if I have the story right, I think boot camp had its birth out of here. Some of the ideas about running boot camp for the youth, some of that idea came from here. It spread, it was hosted by Victory for many years. We had ideas about running VBSs here. And we ran daily vacation Bible schools where we transformed the whole building into a theme. Not just kids coming in and sitting. and do, We transformed the whole building into an airport or into a, a water park or all these things, which were ideas that were unusual. We did, um, some of you would remember dropping gifts at doors, at random doors in the community of Thorncliffe. I see some nods. We had this idea. Man, we just got to go bless this community. We want to we wanna move this direction. We're just going to go pick a random house in this community, and for 12 days straight before Christmas, we're going to drop a gift at their door. Without, we have to call the police to let them know what we were doing so that they didn't think that we were, like we had people sneaking up, dropping a blue bag at the door, ringing the doorbell and running away. And not just one house in Thorncliffe, like 25 Okay, and so we got permission to go and do this thing because it was a God-inspired idea, but it was very unusual. And so things like that have always been the DNA of Victory Church. Unusual ideas, unusual thoughts. Let me tell you one more story because along with the unusual has been the supernatural. And I wish that that talking about the supernatural wasn't paired with the unusual, but for the most part it is. There are so many stories about times that there's been visions of angels or, or, or hearing angels or things like that in, in this place where you're sitting right now. I'm sure Pastor Ron and Veronica could share stories about that. I want to share one story because it couples with the idea of being an unusual, an unusual place. I was sitting in my office just through, through there one night. And had been aware and just sensing, you know, God, there's, there's supernatural things happening. There's healings. There's provisions. There's all these things, and it's awesome. And I was like, why, why do those happen? What, what's the deal? And God had spoken and said, you know, this, this place is so unusual, so out of the way, that this is a place where angels just come, and they, they kind of gather, and they, whatever angels do, I don't know, maybe have a staff meeting. Um, <laughs> And because it's, because it's nondescript, and whatever God's reasons were, I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. I don't know if they made sense or not. But so I was sitting in my office, and I was thinking, oh, that's cool. That's really neat. And then I had that sense. You know, sometimes you get that urge, that inner thing that goes, oh, that's weird. And God said, well, if you want to know what I'm talking about, just go sit in the sanctuary for a minute. And nobody else was here. It was totally quiet. I was working on my own. I was like, oh, why? Like, that's weird. I said, no, just, if you, want to, if you want a sense of what's going on, you want to hear the angels meeting, just go sit in the sanctuary. Now, you've got to understand, this building at night is dark and lonely, okay? <laughs> and it's empty. There's nobody around. There's no other business. Like everything just closes down, right? If you're here in the evening, there's, there's nothing else going on. So, and then I get that sense of, oh, this is beyond just, this is a little weird, right? So imagine you get the, you know, the, the hair stands up a little bit, and I'm like, eh, this is either God or this is going to be really scary, one of the two. So I thought, okay, well, so I came out of my office slowly, came through the dark, you know, everything's dark, 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 dark. And as I'm coming through, I'm thinking, I'll just flick on the lights, it'll be okay, and I'll sit, and I'll, whatever God's doing is fine, I'll figure it out. God's like, yeah, don't turn on any lights. <laughs> You can't, you can't hardly make your way through the building without lights on. So I came through and I just sat on one of those back chairs thinking, this is, this is bizarre, this is weird. But as I did there, God was like, no, oh, you have to understand. I'm at work over this place. I have been at work over this place. My angels rest on this place all the time. And as I sat in those chairs, I just heard the the sound of. I can't describe it beyond, you know, when you hear muffled sounds coming from, you know, outside your window or something like that. 
Everything else was quiet, and I could just hear the sound of movement. It was absolutely astonishing. And then I quickly got up on my chair and ran back to my office, got my keys, and went home, which is probably true because it was a little bit intimidating. But uh, that, that level of supernatural and just the, the, the healings and deliverances and provisions and all kinds of things. I, I would love to tell the story of the day that an angel sat right there. In the, in the flesh, we saw him. I spoke with him. He came in. Evening worship service. Many, some of you were here. That evening, he came in and he sat there. And he said, I said, how, how did, like, why are you here? And he said, well, some of my friends told me about it. I said, you don't have any friends. <laughs> We had no idea who this guy was. Some of my friends told me what was happening, so I came. And I said, well, what's your name? And he, and he told me his name. It was whatever. I can't remember. And I said, oh, well, well like, where are you headed? Where are you from? Oh, I'm just on my way through. Some of my friends told me what was going on here tonight, so I thought I'd stop in. And at the end of when we were done, he went out the door. But interestingly enough, that night, one of the ladies that was here was delivered of demonic oppression. So while we were here worshiping, this fellow sitting right, be, right behind me, and my family as we're worshiping, not having ever seen him, not having, knowing nothing about him. But in the course of the evening, this lady, we're praying for her, long, longer story, but she's, she's delivered demonic oppression. Amazing. These things are part of what known victory is. The unusual, the supernatural. Okay, this is it. I want to read you some riveting scripture as the last point. Are you ready? I'm not even going to tell you where it's from. I'm going to challenge you to go and find it and look it up for yourself because you will want to read the whole chapter. The Jeshana gate was repaired by Joida, son of Pasia, and Meshulam, son of Basoidia. They laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and, in, and bars in place. Next to them, repairs were made by Gibeon and Mizpah, Meltia of Gibeon and Jaden of Maranatha, places under the authority of the governor of Trans-Euphrates. Uziel, son of Hariah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next section, and Hananiah, one of the perfume makers, made repairs next. Don't worry, there's only like 30 more verses to go. Okay. <laughs> Raphia, son of Hur, ruler of the half-district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section. Adjoining this, Jedidiah, son of Harumoth, made repairs opposite his house. And Heltush, son of Hashbaniah, made repairs next to him. And it goes on and on and on. This is, this is the part that encompasses all of us. We read it, and I have no idea who those names are, who those people are. But for 30 years, God has recorded every name that has worked, served, honored, given in this place. Every one of you that has come in and moved a chair, picked up a piece of garbage, swept a floor, made a coffee, whatever it was to serve and honor the house of God here. I just, I just felt it was so important that as a people, you understand that. You understand that God is, is recording so much so that he's put it into words we still read now. And years, generations, eternities from now, all of these things and your names are in, are in the book the same way. And so known victory, Dustin and Beth, if I could encourage and, and go so far as to say, this is what I feel is the Spirit of God, is to be aware. There's unusual things. You're going to have unusual ideas. Your people are going to come with unusual thoughts. Don't worry, that's always been, it's always been the DNA of what happened here. And don't be afraid to pursue them and chase them. God will honor them. Some of them are, are just for learning. Some of them are to establish and birth something that may be for you, it may be for the city, it may be for the body of Christ generally. And then the supernatural. You don't need to chase it, but it's here. 
and you can sense it and you will continually be invited into it. And lastly, for all of you, the, the God-honoring work of just putting hand to service, mouth to service, body in the position of serving the house of God at whatever stage it is, repairing gates, hanging doors, is God-honoring, God-pleasing worship. That's it. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And what a what a great uh, just a great day so far. Thank you, Pastor Jonathan. Thank you, Pastor Ron, for sharing um, such uh, amazing things with us today. Um, I uh, as I was kind of thinking about this, I found it so interesting because um, I've only been here for like two and a half years. So we're celebrating thirty years, and I'm like, I've only been here for two and a half. I'm just like a little baby in this. You know what I mean? Like my 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 part of it is so new. But I feel like God is about to kind of birth something or recreate or redo something in our midst. I have this, this feeling that things that God has already done, we're going to start to see a multiplication of it. The, the salvations we've seen over the years, and I'm sure it's been hundreds over the years. The baptisms, we've seen dozens of people getting baptized. The healings we've seen, the amazing things. I believe that God is about to double it, to triple it, and step into something brand new. And uh, I'm excited to be a part of it. And it's just a great day today to celebrate what God has done. But I believe really a big part of what today is as well is let's get excited about what he's going to do. That is just the start. 30 years, a lot of us in this room aren't even 30 years old. You know, we're, something's about to shift and something's about to change. And I'm so excited to be a part of it. Um, and so what I want to do real quick before I go into my, my quick message, I just want to honor some of the people who have been here for a long time. Those who have been here with you in here for a long time. And so we have a few people who have been here since the 90s. Some of us don't even know what the 90s are. The 90s. Back with phone books. <clears throat> VHS. Blockbuster. Y'all remember Blockbuster? That was my favorite Friday night, right? Some of the things that we don't even know, but some people who have been here since the 90s. So I want to, uh, uh, Carlotta's here with us today. No, right there. She's been here since, uh, she, we don't know for sure, but 1996, being a part of our family. Let's give it up for Carlotta. 96. We have Starley here today. Uh, right there, yeah. And she was here right around that time, maybe a few months later, in 1996, maybe 1997 is when she started coming. Let's give it up for her. And then we have Lewis and Patricia and Andy, who started in 1998 or 1999. Let's give it up for them. Amazing. Then we have uh, the Donater family with like Christian and, and Sam and, and Tammy and Megan who've been here since 1999 as well. Maybe 1998. Yeah. We have Elliot and Mary Joan who've been here since uh, 2006. Amazing. Now I really hope I didn't forget anyone because then I'm going to feel horrible. I've been here since 2021. <laughs> Micah as well. He's like waving, like, what about me? You know, like, don't forget about me. <laughs> Sorry. We're having fun today, all right? It's a celebration. We're having fun. We're family. Like literally and spiritually, right? But 30 years carries big significance, 30 years. You know, if you know 30 years, when you see this, this common occurrence throughout Scripture of the importance of what 30 years means in it comes, it really, if you go down to it as they studied it, and scholars, if they studied it, 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 it comes from symbolizing dedication to a particular task or calling, 30 years. Remember the priests back in, in Numbers 4-3 were initially dedicated to serving at 30 years of age. That's when they started their serving. 30 years. You look at well, uh, the, the, David, he became king. How old was he? He was 30 years old when he became the king. We look at Jesus. Jesus' ministry started. He was baptized around when he was 30 years old. There's significance in 30. But what really 30 means is it's actually a dedication to something, but it's a start of something new as well. It's a start of, of, of all the preparation, all the work, everything that we put into what God has done in this place, everything he's done, we're prepared for what's next. Now, I believe that what's next is going to be amazing. I believe that what God is about to do and what God has already done is amazing. But I believe that the future is going to be better than the past. 
Now the past was amazing. I've heard incredible stories, you heard some today. The past was amazing, but I believe that the future is going to be even better. So I believe that the past 30 years have matured us as a church, have prepared us as a church for what's next, have created something that's a beautiful and we're grateful to all be a part of some part of the story. I think everyone in this place today has had a part to play in what God has done in our midst. And I can say as the pastor today, thank you. Thank you. Because I know that there's been moments, I'm sure, for Pastor Jonathan and Pastor Ron where they woke up Monday, they're like, I'm done. I quit. <laughs> like, I'm going to Walmart, man. Like, I'm done. I can, I can imagine. Why? Because there's Mondays I'm like, let's call it. You know, like it's over. It's not always easy. It's not always easy, but what I love is 30 years of generosity, right? 30 years of service and 30 years of miracles and 30 years of salvation, 30 years of restoration and 30 years of revival and 30 years of dedication, 30 years of sacrifice, blood, sweat, and tears poured into this place. That God is building his church and he has been since the beginning. It's a testament of God's faithfulness. And I know, like any organization, like any church, there's a lot of people who, 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 have, who have been hurt. I know there's a lot of us who have been hurt. Not just, I'm not talking about our church, just globally been so hurt by the church and there's so many things that are the struggle for so many people. But I want to say thank you. Thank you for building. Thank you for being generous. Thank you for serving. Thank you for painting. Thank you for sweeping. Thank you for plunging toilets. It's a horrible job. Someone's got to do it. Thank you. But I'm excited for the future. And in Philippians 1, 4 to 6, it's Paul, he's writing. And he says, whenever I pray, I make my requests for all of you with joy. He's pumped about what's going on. He's pumped. It's been amazing. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. He's pumped up. Sometimes you hear him, he's like not pumped up about what's going on, right? He's pumped. And then verse six, this is it. He says, and I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ returns. It's been good, but it's not over. It's not over, it's not finished. We're not done here, why? Because he's not done here. We're not done because he hasn't come back yet and we're gonna keep going, keep fighting, keep building until he comes back. Because it's not complete yet, it's not over. 30 years. Now those of us who, maybe you're not 30 years old, you're like, 30 years? I don't even know what that feels like. I've never seen a, seen a three zero on my birthday cake yet. That seems like a long time. But how long, how fast has that time gone? Y'all know what I'm talking about? 30 years. I want to tell you what I see. I want to tell you what I see God doing in our midst. Or I'm like, I didn't sleep a lot. That's probably the biggest problem, yeah. I want to tell you what I see. And I'm telling you what I see. I'm, I know I'm not the only one who's seen him. Now what I mean by see, I don't mean physically. I mean what we spiritually see. And what I see, I see a community of people dedicated to making Jesus known in Edmonton. I see a, a family that's committed to generosity and taking care of the widows and the orphans. That's what I see. I see multi-generations. I see kids and parents and grandparents all worshiping together in unity and love. 
I see, I see a community that's filled with multi, um, uh, multicultural people from all over the world, every language, every nation represented in what God is doing here at Known Victory Church. That's what I see. I might see a church that's known by how we love one another, that's known by who we are about, that we're known for being about Jesus more than anything else. So I see. I see a church that's busting at the seams where our biggest concern is we don't know how we can fit all the people that are coming to know Jesus in our, in our space. A place where people are coming and they don't know Jesus yet and they find freedom and chains are broken. I see people coming in here so broken and so hurting and they find the freedom that I've found. That's what I see. I see people giving their lives to Jesus every single week. Not just on Sunday, but midweek when we take someone out for coffee. We share our story and they come to know Jesus. I see marriages being restored. I see sons and daughters coming home. I see people getting healed of sickness and disease. I see a place that the Holy Spirit is moving and I see people walking through these doors and chains breaking immediately. Because what God is doing is so powerful and so tangible. That's what I see. I see a place where we've seen it before. I believe we'll see it again. You know, our first service, from what we are told, had 375 people, our very first service that we ever held as a church. 375 people. If God's done it then, he can do it again. And I'm not talking just people being like, oh, you know, this is cool. I mean, like people coming and not anything we do, but they find a place where they can call home and they can find freedom. They can find connection. They can find what they desperately need. That's what I see. That's where we're going. I've heard visions people have had for our church. I've, 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 I've heard some of the things people have seen. And I'm excited about what God's going to do. I think all of us as a family, those of us who call Victory Church on the Rock, known Victory Church, those of us who call it home now, and those of us who used to call it home, that wherever you go, you will be a light wherever you go. That you'll be a light in the darkness. You'll be a light at work. You'll be a light at home. That my biggest concern is the church I see is not just our church. The church I see is a church in Edmonton that's unified and ready to fight for the souls of those who call this city home. That we're not fighting with each other. That we're not, you know, you're wrong. How can we serve each other? No matter all of it, we serve one another with love. Even if we disagree. That we're quick to forgive when we hurt each other. We're quick to forgive when we make mistakes. That's what I see. And I want to encourage you, wherever you go, whether this is your church or you have another church, I want to encourage you, let's be sharers of the gospel. Let's share Jesus more than anything. Let's share Jesus. Share your story. What has God done in your life? I think all of us here today, why we're here today is because this church is at an impact in some way in your life. I don't know everyone's story of what God's done in your life through this church, through our pastors, through our ministry. I don't know. But we're all here today to celebrate as a family the beauty of the past 30 years. You know, a lot of churches, they don't even make it to 30 years. They don't make it through. But we're still here. That means God's not done. He's moving. Similar to what God said to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Be strong, be courageous. 
That's what I feel God telling me sometimes. He's like, be strong and courageous. I'm like, I, I know the words, but I don't know the feeling sometimes. Like I know, be strong and courageous. I'm like, yeah, but I feel weak and tired and angry. I don't feel strong and courageous all the time. And I, I'm assuming you don't either, but maybe you're tougher than me. I don't know. Be strong and courageous wherever you go. Let people know you by who you serve. 